Greetings, kittens. Welcome to the podcast of Doom, the podcast devoted to epic failure analysis. My name is David Appleson. Today we will continue our examination of two well-known forced marches, the Trail of Tears which saw American Indian tribes in the U.S. Southeast forced to march from their ancestral homes to undesirable lands west of the Mississippi River, and the March of Bataan which saw defeated American and Filipino prisoners of war forced to march 60 miles to Camp O'Donnell in the Philippines. Last week we left the Cherokee, having finally made it to their new home west of the Mississippi River. The American and Filipino prisoners in the Bataan Peninsula had arrived at Camp O'Donnell. The problems for the Cherokee didn't end with their arrival in eastern Oklahoma. First, they came with little more than the clothing on their backs. Second, those who traveled the Trail of Tears were not the first Cherokee to relocate to Oklahoma. Those who left voluntarily had been there for years, and some of them had received resettlement money. Old animosities would flare up between the Treaty Party and the Nationalist Party. There was also hostility between the established Cherokees, who were ecking out a subsistence living, and their newly arrived brethren who had nothing. The new arrivals outnumbered the established Cherokee by a ratio of two to one. Arguments arose over loyalties, land, and tribal politics, but the greatest animosity may have been between the Nationalists and the Treaty Party. To the Nationalists it appeared the Treaty supporters got the best breaks by surrendering the Cherokees' right to their land, while the Treaty members blamed the Nationalists for not seeing the inevitability of their hopeless situation and making things worse for everyone by holding out. On June 22, 1839, Treaty leader John Ridge was attacked inside his home by Nationalists and stabbed to death in front of his family. The Nationalists also killed his father and another Treaty leader, Elias Boudinot. All three had signed the Treaty of New Dakota. But Chief Ross kept the tribe from splintering, reminding them that they were one family and of one blood. He told the Cherokee that a house divided against itself cannot stand, and that was 19 years before Abraham Lincoln borrowed the same biblical passage during his campaign for Senator of Illinois. That's Mark 325 for those keeping score at home. Ross and the leader of the Treaty Party, David Van patched up their differences and founded a new tribal government and a new constitution based roughly on the old one. The Cherokee continued to survive as a nation for many decades. They prospered selling supplies to miners who were heading west to dig for gold in California in 1849. The leadership supported the Confederacy during the Civil War, probably influenced by the Confederate states around them. When the Union won the war, many Cherokee were left destitute, just as many Southerners were. More encroachments upon their land by whites followed in the years after the Civil War. As a result, the Cherokee Nation shrank piece by piece. In 1907, Oklahoma was admitted to the Union as a state, and the Cherokee Nation would be subsumed by the new state. In 1971, President Nixon signed into law an act that recognized the Cherokee as a sovereign nation within Oklahoma. Today, the Cherokee are the second largest tribe in the United States after the Navajo. As per the 2010 U.S. Census, the Cherokee population was just over 284,000. In 2005, members of the Oklahoma Cherokee met with members of the East Band of Cherokee, descendants of those who fled the forced removal in Chattanooga, Tennessee, on former Cherokee land. Speaking at the event, Principal Chief Chad Smith said, We are not a people of the past. We are a people of the present. And for many centuries, we will be a people of the future. For the prisoners of war who were forced to march through Bataan, conditions hardly improved at Camp O'Donnell. Most of the Americans were relocated to Camp Cabanatuan, five miles away. Only the medical personnel and those too sick or weak to make the trip were left at O'Donnell. Altogether, about 1,500 Americans and 22,000 Filipino prisoners died while they were at O'Donnell from starvation, illness, or beatings. At Cabinatuan, the drinking water was dirty and hauled in from a murky creek two miles away in empty oil drums. Prisoners spent the greater part of the day standing in line in the hot sun to get their drinking water. 
By their second month at Cabinatuan, sweet potatoes and squash were added to their diet of rice. Malaria and dysentery were rampant, and patients in what substituted for a hospital were forced to lie on the floor in their own blood and filth. Prisoners were organized into labor details. The first job was to dig pits to bury the dead prisoners. Some of those who worked on the labor detail died of exhaustion from digging in the extreme heat and were buried in the pits they helped dig. Americans would be held as prisoners of war at Cabinatuan for two and a half years, but most of the American prisoners were shipped to Japan, where they were detained in camps and were often used for heavy labor such as coal mining. Those in Japan would not be released until the Japanese capitulation in August 1945. But there were still many prisoners left in the Philippines. Some events that happened during this time raised the urgency of recapturing the Philippines and freeing the prisoners there. On August 1, 1944, the Americans intercepted a Japanese letter detailing the kill-all policy. The policy allowed local commanders to execute prisoners of war without orders from Tokyo. The second event was the Paloan Massacre. Some prisoners from Cabinatuan were sent to the Philippine island of Paloan to build an airfield at the same time that American forces were landing troops in other parts of the Philippines. Already, American bombers were hitting Japanese ships in the harbors. The Japanese guards allowed the prisoners to build shelters that were no more than four feet high and covered with logs and dirt. On December 14, 1944, after American bombers were sighted, the Japanese ordered 150 POWs into the shelter. In a planned move, about 50 to 60 Japanese soldiers doused the shelter with gasoline and set it afire. When attempting to escape, the prisoners were shot and bayoneted. Of the 150 POWs, only 11 survived. Beginning in October 1944, General Douglas MacArthur led the campaign to retake the Philippines. In January 1945, Army Rangers penetrated 30 miles behind Japanese lines under the cover of darkness and rescued 489 POWs and 33 civilians from Cabinatuan, including British and Dutch soldiers. There were other successful raids carried out at other prisoner camps throughout the Philippines. More than 2,600 American prisoners died at Cabinatuan. Allied forces retook most of the islands by the time the Japanese formally surrendered in August 1945. However, pockets of Japanese soldiers still resisted in that country, with the last not surrendering until 1974. I wouldn't suggest that either the Trail of Tears or the Death March of Bataan was preventable. Of course, there were many points during both narratives that different actions could have been taken that might have prevented the ultimate tragic outcome. But really, both of these forced marches were just an example of a much wider phenomenon taking place during a time of rising tensions throughout the world. The Trail of Tears is just one example of indigenous people coming into violent contact with an outside culture. The real encounter between American Indians and Europeans happened over a much greater area and covered a longer period of time and was filled with a great deal of tragedy. When I asked my wife, who is Blackfoot Indian, to name the greatest disaster that struck American Indians, she was succinct and to the point. Alcohol. I agree. I chose the Trail of Tears because, remaining true to the spirit of the podcast, it is about a particular event that took place in a specific place and time. It also represented many of the difficulties indigenous people faced on this continent following their contact with Europeans. Violent confrontation, broken promises, illegal land grabs, forced removal, deceit, the devastating effects of contagious diseases transported from the old to the new world, and yes, alcohol, which was sold to the Cherokee with the intention of causing social disruption and disintegration. For the Death March of Bataan, it was an example of Japanese cruelty toward their prisoners and towards many other people in general. But it would be hard to isolate just one nation as having a monopoly on cruelty during the Second World War. Before the United States dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they firebombed the cities of Tokyo and Dresden, just to name a few. If you go back to Episode 1, The Great Peshtigo Fire, 
you will learn how the Americans and their British allies developed the idea of firebombing a city. The Soviets killed and raped millions of civilians when they turned the tables on the Nazis, not to mention the millions of their own citizens killed by starvation in the Holodomor. Also, we should not forget that while the Japanese were beating American prisoners in the Philippines, back in the United States, Japanese Americans were rounded up into concentration camps, but we called them internment camps. Bataan is just one small example from that time, and I believe it shows how easy it is to lose sight of who you are as an individual and who you are as a collective group opposed to another collective group. I mentioned both instances involved manifest destiny. Even if the Japanese did not use that exact phrase, their ambitions during the Second World War were to build an enormous empire that stretched east, just as the Americans dreamed of an enormous empire that stretched west. Both ideas are based on the premise of a superior culture overtaking and displacing inferior cultures for the common good, and often with God's blessing. If we want to prevent future trails of tears and death marches, we have to be careful of what philosophers have called constructing the other. That is, people grouping themselves together based on one common theme such as race, religion, nationality, gender, and grouping their opposites together as an inferior group because they are different. It is a very old problem, but over the years we have managed to solve some very old problems. As we are reasserting ourselves in the Levant, we should remember the damage done by the treatment of prisoners at Abu Ghraib. Would contact have avoided the trouble? What if Commodore Perry never went to Japan, or if Europeans never colonized the Americas? It is hard to imagine history not following a similar path anyway. If it hadn't been Perry in the United States, there were plenty of other colonial powers that wanted to start trade relations with Japan. If the Europeans hadn't sought new trade routes, who is to say that some Asian nation wouldn't have landed in the Americas with the intent to colonize the new lands with their own people? Advances in trade and navigation made exploration of the world inevitable. Though there is no saying that contact of non-European cultures with indigenous people would have played out the same way. I want to thank everyone who has listened to this podcast. It has brought me a great deal of pride and pleasure in producing each episode. I wasn't certain that a podcast dealing with tragedy, death, and destruction would gather any listeners. But I was hoping to find a niche, as there are already a great many podcasts that deal with achievement, success, and the secrets of gaining vast wealth. Thank you for being a part of that niche. Studying poor decisions doesn't make us pessimists, it makes us smarter. I'm going to be taking a sabbatical from the podcast. For the next nine months, I'll be working towards my certificate in electronic learning. That is, how to teach and train people who are separated by distance using electronic delivery methods such as the Internet. Between that and full-time work, I will be kept very busy. It is my hope to return to the podcast of Doom in the summer of 2015, I've put together a long list of potential topics, and I'm always excited to hear about your suggestions. So until next year, keep your ears pinned and your tail taut. <laughs>